nature not I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case open and shut no doubt about it I'm a nature nut today we'll go bird watching tomorrow we'll catch toads the next day we'll take photographs of bugs along the road I never get the feeling that I'm in a rut that's why I'm a nature nut well I'm a nature nut I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case open and shut no doubt about it I'm a nature nut well hello there nature nuts guess what tonight we're going night bugging that's why we're here and here is the best place for looking for insects at night in North America, north of the Mexican border, which is the area around Tucson, Arizona. We're here at the right time of year as well. Late summer is the best time for nighttime insects. And I just got here, I'm getting excited already because I'm seeing some great, great bugs. For example, just over there, there is a monolima. It's a beetle, a longhorn beetle with very long antennae. Uh, it feeds on cactus and, ooh, it's just gorgeous, beautiful, smooth contours, big paddy feet for gripping those cacti. The eyes wrap around the base of the antenna. Superb, elegant creature. And I just noticed walking up here, there's a beautiful lubber grasshopper feeding on this old cactus fruit here. Now, most grasshoppers are gonna be green or brown, camouflaged color, but this one, look at it. It's bright black, yellow, red, orange. That tells you it tastes bad. And if you're the kind of person who eats grasshoppers, and I know that you're out there, don't eat this one. Bad. I don't know why they're called lubbers, mind you. I mean, obviously they're land lubbers, they love to eat cactus fruit, but past that, I can't help you. Anyway, we've got to get our equipment ready before night falls, so we're ready for the night bugging. Uh, so why don't we take care of that right now? Well, the good news is the equipment we need for a night bugging is very simple. And there are two general sorts of night bugging. The first of which we call night lighting because you use a light. And as you well know, bugs are attracted to lights at night. Now you can use just about any sort of light as long as you don't use one of those yellow bug proof lights. But uh, some lights work better than others. You'll get quite a bit of things coming to a regular incandescent porch light like, you know, a 50 or 100 watt uh, bulb. But if you have a bulb with or a light with a bit more UV, ultraviolet in the spectrum, you'll get more insects because in insects are attracted to the ultraviolet. A mercury vapor light is also very, very good because it has a lot of UV in it and insects are especially attracted to UV light. But the, uh, the sort of light that I like to use is a black light and it also has a lot of UV. This is a fluorescent black light. I've got one that plugs into the cigarette lighter of a vehicle, which is very, very handy because you can drive out into some wacky, wild, remote place and then uh, just plug into your cigarette lighter. Bring a white bed sheet with you and look at that. You see how the white bed sheet kind of glows bluish purple in the black light? You know why that is? Yeah, it's really neat. The whiteners in laundry detergent, when ultraviolet light hits them, they give off blue light in return, and that's what makes your white clothes look whiter when, uh, when you wear them. For us, it works very well because it allows us to see what sort of insects are on the sheet, and you'll also want to bring along some sort of a flashlight uh, or a headlamp so you can see what's, uh, what's coming to the sheet and get a better look at it. And if you want, you can bring along some vials or whatever so you can manage the bugs that come to the sheet and get a really good look at them. So that's night lighting. The other sort of night bugging is, well, it's just a matter of going out and looking for bugs at night. And there, the equipment is even more simple. All you need really is a flashlight or a headlamp. And, uh, 
the great thing about this sort of night bugging is that the bugs are doing natural things, whereas when they come to a light, they're doing something quite unnatural. This way you can often watch them, you know, behaving and doing what they would normally do. They don't seem to notice, some of them at least, that, that a, there is a light shining on them. So it's cool. It's a lot of fun. And again, bring a couple of vials. And what else can I tell you? Well, I guess the only other advice I have is take some some insect books or uh, membership cards in nature organizations. Those are handy in case anyone mistakes you for a nighttime prowler and they don't believe that you're looking for night bugs. A big jar of beetles would do the trick there too. I think we're gonna start with some black lighting, some night lighting. I can hardly wait, I just know we're gonna get some good stuff. And uh, I've asked my friend David Madison, he's an entomologist from the University of Arizona in Tucson. He's gonna join us for some night bugging. He and I have been night bugging many times before and we've known each other since we were teenagers. So uh, I can hardly wait. David, how's it going? It's going great. It is. And so this is the professional rig that you've got from the university, is that right? Yeah, this is the one that we've used for quite a few years. And it runs off? There's a generator, a gas power generator that uh, powers the, the black lights. Yeah, this is really impressive with uh, two tubes on this side, two tubes on the other yeah. side. Yeah, so that it, we get the full coverage. So things flying on either side of the black light sheet will be attracted to it. Uh, beautiful, so. beautiful. Well, I can hardly wait to see what comes in tonight, but in the meantime, I'm gonna go out and do a little headlamping. Okay, I'll check the light. All right. In the winter, you can always use your black light to make tacky posters from the 70s glow in the dark. All right, well, will you have a look at this? This beetle just came into the black light, and this is another Southern Arizona classic. This is Dynasties Grantii, which means it's a Hercules beetle, which is part of the rhinoceros beetle subgroup of the scarab beetle family, and it's just absolutely stunning. There are two species of Hercules beetles north of Mexico. This is the larger of the two, and in fact, a big one of these will be the biggest beetle anywhere north of Mexico. So it's really a wonderful thing to run across. This one is a male, and you can tell that by the fact that it's got this big horn here on the pronotum, the thorax shield, and another horn here on the head, and they use those to fight with other males. Sometimes with rhino beetles, if you poke them, they'll fight back, but this one doesn't seem to have a lot of fight in them right now. They have a gorgeous pattern of splotches on the wing covers, and each one has its own unique pattern of splotches, so they're all uniquely beautiful. It's a tremendous beetle. It's a beetle that I've wanted to see ever since I first learned of its existence, which was a long, long time ago. We're doing really well here. I can hardly wait to see what comes in next. The biggest Hercules beetle lives in South America and it can be 15 centimeters or six inches long. You know, in the days when they used to use candles and torches for light, people were mystified at the way moths would fly into the flame and kill themselves. Well, nowadays it's much less dramatic because they just bounce off light bulbs, but it's still mysterious. Now there is an entomological theory that explains why they do that. And I'm gonna demonstrate it to you right now. Now let's say I'm a moth out flying at night. For me, straight ahead is right about there. My eyes are fixed in my head. I can't turn them. And let's say I see the moon, see the moon over that way. And if I keep the moon at about that angle to my straight ahead position, I will walk or fly, I should say, in a straight line because the relative position of the moon doesn't change. You can try this at home with any distant object, but if on the other hand, I were to mistake a mere light bulb for the moon, and you try the same trick, 
you find very quickly that you fly past the light, you have to readjust the angle. And as you keep readjusting the angle, you find you spiral inward until finally you touch the light. Oof. You know, the bad part of all this is that with all these light bulbs, some species of moths that used to be quite common are becoming much more rare because they're spending their brief lives flapping around light bulbs instead of looking for a place to lay their eggs or find a mate. And that doesn't mean we should feel guilty about night bugging. It means we should feel guilty about all those other lights where bugs are flapping around and there's nobody there to appreciate them. No educational or scientific value at all. It's good that most cities are switching to those yellow sodium vapor lights, though, because they don't attract bugs. Bugs can't see them. Night bugging, leaving your porch light on, you got me. Safety gear, a grin from ear to ear, and Lydia, my dear, we can go night bugging all night long. So what if the neighbors call the cops? Hey, I can explain, I can explain. Wait till they see what we've caught in our traps. They'll not be the same after that. No. Night bugging. I'm putting on something light. Night bugging. With that light in your eyes, it's bright. I brought my great big jar. Or we could drive off in my car to find some small cafe so that Lydia. My dear, we can go night bugging all night long. Night bugging, don't wear anything too. think it's out of sight that's why Lydia my dear I'm night bugging here with you Lydia, by the way, was a Schistocerca grasshopper, sometimes a pest of crops in the southern United States. Okay, well here's a night bugging technique that absolutely anyone can afford. Just left out a little pile of rolled oats here, just regular rolled oats, you know. And uh, the hope was that it would attract a Jerusalem cricket, a great big wonderful cricket-like insect. But it's not going to happen because these ants are taking the oat pile away as quickly as they can, one oat at a time. Give it a try, it's a neat technique. You might attract other things, maybe darkling beetles, other sorts of uh, crickets, grasshoppers, grigs, stuff like that. Wonderful. Anyway, this place is just absolutely hopping with night bugs. There's a black widow spider in her web up there, sitting under her egg sacs. That's a neat thing to see anywhere, of course. Oh, and look at this. Look at this right here. It's a ground-dwelling praying mantid, and it's looking for something to eat. Oh, that's nice. That's a very small mantid. It's only about uh, two and a half centimeters an inch long, but still a full-fledged praying mantid, mantis, same thing. Very cool. This place is hopping with night bugs. I love it. I wonder what we're gonna find next. Some mantids hunt on the ground while others prefer to prowl around in vegetation or on tree bark. 
Well, it sounds like David's found something interesting down by the pond. Let's go have a look. Okay, well, we found a good place for bombardier beetles, and they're all over the sand here. They've got blue wing covers, and the rest of the body is kind of orange. They're easy to recognize, and you've got to like these, David. They're part of your favorite group of beetles. Yeah, John, that's right. They're, they're ground beetles, carabids, and one of the really neat things about bombardier beetles is how they defend themselves. Uh, the group of beetles that these guys belong to all have defensive chemicals that they secrete, but bombardier beetles do them one better. What they've got is at the back of their abdomen, they've got two chambers. One of them is an explosion chamber, if you can believe that. And the other one is a storage place for the chemicals that are going to explode. And what happens is when one of these beetles get chomped down by, on by something, they squirt this one chamber, everything in that chamber, into the explosion chamber. And when they get in there, they meet a chemical that's sitting in there, an enzyme. And that causes the two exploding chemicals to react with one another, and they shoot out the end of the abdomen at the boiling point of water. And it's not just the heat that comes out, but it's some nasty poisons. There's quinones in there, which are pretty nasty. And so those hot quinones coming out really gives a real punch to whatever is just chomped down on it, and they'll let go right away. I've got some in the vial here. If I pick them up with the forceps, we'll see boiling quinones come out the tip of their abdomen. That's right. Oh, uh, excellent. <laughs> oh, I like them. Very, yes. very interesting. Mm -hmm. And is that is that system, is that basically a modification of the defense glands of other ground beetles? Yeah, that's right, John. All ground beetles have defensive glands that produce chemicals, uh, often rather noxious chemicals, that they secrete when disturbed, and they use that to scare away predators, and these, these bombardier beetles just have really fancy versions of those defensive systems. Yeah, right, so they're all like skunks, and this is like a super skunk. That's right, that's right. It's like yeah. an exploding skunk. That's right, that's right. <laughs> oh, yeah, ooh. And you picked up some with your fingers too, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Um, when you pick these guys up, they, um, the effect that they have on your fingers when they squirt those hot quinones is to turn it brown. And most of the time it doesn't hurt very much, but on occasion if they get a particularly tender spot, you really feel it. Man, so are you scarred for life here, Dean? <laughs> no, just probably a couple days and then it'll, the color will disappear. Oh, I think it's a badge of honor. Man, look at it all. Look at them all. It's incredible. Wow. This is really good. John, look, a Plusiotis. A Plusiotis, no kidding. Yep, look down oh, here. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. I've never seen a live Plusiotis, and that's the greatest Plusiotis of all, too, isn't it? Yep, Plusiotis gloriosa. Boy, that's a fine beetle. It's hard to believe that those colors are produced biologically. They look so metallic. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Superb. What a beast. What a beast. Super. Oh, and there's a mantispid right here. Oh, yeah. See, it's oh, got it's the a little tiny thing. Yeah, it's got the front legs built very much like a praying mantis, but it's it's completely unrelated. It's more closely related to things like lace wings and yeah, dobs and flies. And stuff. Ant lions, right. Yeah, we've got a whole mess of sphinx moths here. Do you know what this one is? I think it's a type of manduka. Ah, uh, yeah, it's a great name, isn't it? Manduka. Just uh, it must camouflage beautifully on a tree trunk in the daytime. What about if you go straight down the sheet from there, you get to a lineated sphinx. Yeah. That's a nice one. That's one that you find almost all over North America with pink on the underwing there, too. Yeah, that's just a real beautiful thing. Yeah. I love the forebody with those stripes. Oh, it's elegant. It's extremely elegant. I wonder if we could see one of their, um, their proboscis, the mouth part that they use like a straw to suck up things from... Oh, it's huge on these things, isn't it? Oh, I don't want to bother them too much. Oh, here it comes. Here. This buddy's coming to the rescue. Now you can just see it sort of coiled yeah, up right boy. there. Oh, oh, look at this. This one has just almost a geometric oh, that's pattern. that's beautiful. Boy, that's excellent. Yeah, some of them are quite sort of broad-winged and others look like fighter planes. That one looks familiar. That's almost like one that we get back home. I wonder 
if that's the Gemini Sphinx, or I can never remember which is which in that little group there. The so, I Merinthius. so I suppose those hind wings are to startle things. Oh, those are not, not bad eye spots, those yeah. ones. So that most of the time those things are hidden, but if, they're, if the moth is disturbed, they'd move their front wings out of the way and expose those eye spots. Yeah. And then this looks like a nose. You think? Oh, yeah. Ah, pink elephant. <laughs> Boy, when these sphinx moths bang into your clothing, you just, you feel it. It's like somebody's, you know, throwing pickles at you or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, about the size of a pickle, don't you think? Yeah. Look at that thing. Yeah, this one certainly It's like a pickle with wings. Oh, and look at the weevil just above this, this moth. The really oh, long snout the coming. Yeah. yeah. That's neat. Yeah, it's a huge snout. numbers of sphinx moths. Boy, oh, this is this is what black lighting is all about. This is superb. In the tropics, black lights attract so many bugs it can be difficult to breathe when you get close to the sheet. Okay, well, things are still coming into the black light, but uh, I don't know. I've run out of time. I gotta sign off. I hope you enjoyed the world of night bugging, and I hope you understand you don't have to come all the way down to southeastern Arizona to go night bugging in late summer either. You can do it wherever it is you live, and it's a wonderful way to find out just how weird and tremendous the world of backyard bugs really is. I love the world of backyard bugs. That's why I'm a nature nut. And I hope you are too. Anyway, we'll see you again soon. Well, I gotta find out what just came into the black light. It sounds like a small plane just came into the black light. Excuse me. Same time each and every week, uncensored and uncut. No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut. <laughs>